Thanks very much, Jeffrey. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy Reformation Day. Woo, woo. Um, the text this morning is, I was just, it just hit me. I thought of yesterday as my Reformation Day lecture. And so today's text is sort of Catholic, <laughs> which is ironic. But uh, um, uh, I, I want to meditate on this uh, passage of Scripture, which has been in many ways sort of the motto for the Cultural Liturgies project that I've been working on. I want you to take a look around, and I want you to notice something. Um, folks who come to seminary are a very particular self-selecting crew. I don't want to pick on you, but you're not exactly normal. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I'm one of you. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I, I, I would do it all again. But let's be honest. We're kind of a strange bunch. Um, we actually voluntarily sign up to think all day long. You are investing in a life of reflection, study, and what I hope will be lifelong investigation. So when you hear the words, soteriology, or propitiation, or epistemology. Your heart is strangely warmed. <laughs> you crave knowledge. You desire wisdom. You want to love God with your mind. It's fantastic. It's an answer to a call from God. Now, I just want to point out then, though, that folks like us, and let's recognize that we're not really quite normal, folks like us have certain tastes and tendencies when it comes to reading the Bible. For example, I think we have a little bit of a habit of reading Paul as articulator-in-chief. So the epistles are really this didactic center of the New Testament. They are the default home for those of us concerned with doctrine and theological knowledge. We read Paul as if he were sort of Louis Burkhoff in a nutshell. And we read Paul's epistles as if they were the acorn just waiting to blossom into that beautiful oak tree that is Carl Henry's God, Revelation, and Authority. But when you read Paul from a, just a slightly different angle, you'll notice that Paul's letters are suffused passion. There is an intimacy and affection and passion to Paul that we can miss if we sort of anachronistically remake him in our own didactic image. Of no letter, I think, is this more true than his heartfelt epistle to the church in Philippi. Paul has a long, intimate history with this congregation. And the letter is characterized by an affection that is affecting. Consider, for example, this opening passage from chapter 1. He yearns for them. He yearns for them with affection. These are the confessions of an intimate friend and brother. They're not just the cool observations of a distant teacher. So I'm especially interested this morning in the heart of this passage in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1. Here we have Paul's fundamental prayer for the Christians in Philippi. Now, since we tend to read Paul in our own image, we might hastily conclude that this is a prayer for knowledge. That he prays that they might abound in knowledge and discernment, that they might be able to evaluate and have precise knowledge of what is excellent, what is best, what really matters. In other words, we might hastily sort of read this passage and conclude that Paul wants them to be like us, <laughs> smart Christians, knowledgeable Christians. But look again at Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. That's not quite Paul's prayer. This is my prayer, says Paul, that your, what? Love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. We don't even know what to do with that. <laughs> In many ways, 
we remain children of the Enlightenment. We've made the epistemological turn, and we assume that knowledge is the condition of everything. We're all Kantians now. There's no escaping it. So we could, we could understand if Paul prayed that the Philippians might know what they should love. That prayer makes sense to us. I pray that you know what you ought to love. Indeed, on a quick read, I think that's actually what we hear in this passage. But in fact, do you notice, he prays the inverse. That they might love in order to know. He prays that their love might abound because that love is actually the condition for knowing rightly, for discerning and evaluating what is, as some translations put it, what is excellent or what is best. Or I still think a fair paraphrase of that is what really matters. So what could this mean? I pray that your love might abound so that you can know. And what would it mean for those of us who are invested in the project of theological education? What if we love in order to know? In what I think is a really remarkable book called Paul's Way of Knowing, the New Testament scholar Ian Scott notes that for Paul, there is an intimate link between virtue and knowledge. So there, there is a sense in which there are ethical, moral conditions for knowing rightly. For example, Scott points out that in 1 Corinthians, throughout the text, the, the, the scripture of 1 Corinthians, the virtue and posture of humility is actually necessary if one is going to attain knowledge. So you need a certain virtuous disposition as the pre-knowledge requirement to attain truth. And above all, throughout Paul's corpus, the virtue of charity or love, which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, is the necessary condition for right perception. So in an ironic sense, Paul is not a realist. <laughs> that is, he sees, in fact, that there are pre-rational conditions for true knowledge and wisdom. The theologian Stanley Hauerwas once remarked, we do not see reality just by opening our eyes. We do not see reality just by opening our eyes. I want to suggest that there is a Pauline intuition there. Because for Paul, to rightly see reality for what it is, one needs to love the source of all reality first. Or better, we could say, to rightly understand creation, one must rightly love the creator. There is an affective condition for epistemic access. This is what happens if you ask a philosopher to preach, okay? <laughs> the, the easier way to summarize it is simply this. We love in order to know. Here in germ, I think, is a biblical notion that interestingly sort of endures throughout subsequent Western thought, popping up as a constant counter witness to our default tendency to become rationalists. So uh, um, this biblical Pauline intuition, I love in order to know, we love in order to know, is perhaps, I think, most powerfully expanded and made sense of by St. Augustine. But then that articulation of loving in order to understand is precisely what turns up again, for example, in Blaise Pascal. The heart has reasons of which reason knows nothing. And don't let Oprah tell you what that means. This is a biblical Pauline intuition that there is a mode of knowing that is affective, that is rooted in love, that is the condition for knowing rightly. And then interestingly, there's a 20th century story to be told here because the Augustinian work of Blaise Pascal actually has a big impact on someone like Martin Heidegger, who then has a subsequent impact on postmodern thought. So one of the reasons why I think Christians shouldn't be so knee-jerk dismissive of postmodern thought is because actually 
there are certain intuitions in it that carry a biblical pedigree that tracks back to a passage like this in Philippians chapter 1. So I, I would like to dwell for a little bit on Augustine as a fellow expositor, a fellow reader of Paul. Think of this as an expansion on Paul's point. In one of Augustine's earliest works called the Soliloquies, Augustine affirms the same point. We love in order to know. Now, the Soliloquies is a work that I think not many, very many people are familiar with. It's written and composed very shortly after he becomes a Christian. He then sort of commits himself to a community of mutual pursuit of truth that's almost like a kind of monastic community characterized by certain disciplines to seek wisdom. And in that time, he composes this little work called The Soliloquies. It's an odd little book because it's sort of an internal dialogue between Augustine and reason. So it's, I don't want to say Augustine's talking to himself, but he's kind of talking to himself. He has this internal dialogue going on between himself and reason. And the quest of the dialogue is to know God and to know oneself. This is a trope that you'll hear echoed again in John Calvin's Institutes. To know God and the soul. To know oneself is to know God. To know God is to come to know oneself. But what's interesting in the soliloquies is before he can achieve, or before he can hope to achieve any sort of knowledge, Augustine has to pray. O oh, oh God, creator of the universe, give me first that I might pray aright so that I might know aright. Give me first that I might learn to pray aright so that I can know God and the soul. The petition and discipline of prayer then is the means of healing the affections so that we might see well. When you hear that language of the affections, it's completely legitimate if little John Edwards bells go off in the back of your head. Jonathan Edwards bells, because it's the same sort of theme. This culminates, this dialogue in which reason is seeking truth but has to learn to pray, culminates in a beautiful passage that I want to reproduce up here uh, on the slide if we can so that you can follow along. It's, 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 it would be a lot to listen to, but if you can follow along. Here's how it goes. Reason is speaking. I reason. And am in the minds as the power of looking is in the eyes. Having eyes is not the same thing as looking, and looking is not the same thing as seeing. The soul, therefore, needs three things. Eyes, which it can use aright, looking, and seeing. It is impossible to show God to a mind vitiated and sick. Only the healthy mind can see him. But if the mind does not believe that, only thus will it attain vision, it will not seek healing. Even if it believes that this is true and that only so will it attain the vision, but at the same time despairs of healing, will it not abandon the quest and refuse to obey the precepts of the physician? So the first intuition here is that if the mind is going to know, the mind has to be healed. But if it's going to be healed, it has to believe that healing is possible. So Augustine replies, most assuredly, especially because the disease must have sharp remedies. So, to faith, the belief that you could be healed, and hope, the hope that healing is possible, must we add hope. But suppose it believes all this is true and hopes that healing is possible, but does not love and desire the promised light, and thinks it must be meantime content with its darkness through which habit has become pleasant. Will it not no less spurn the physician? Perfectly true. Therefore, a third thing is necessary. Love. In other words, the soliloquies goes on to explore this theme that if I want to achieve wisdom, if I want to know what is true, actually what I need to attend to first is not building up my encyclopedic knowledge of data, is not just expanding the storehouse of intellectual ideas that I have in my head. What I first need to attend to is my loves, my longings, my desires, my affections. And in fact, what those need is healing, restoration, right direction to the lover of my soul. The opening of Augustine's Confessions 
The whole of the Confessions is a prayer. And in the very first paragraph, Augustine prays, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And one of the most beautiful dynamics that characterizes the Confessions is that Augustine gets to the point where he knows everything that he needs to know, but he's still not in Christ because his longings and loves and desires, his heart still isn't there. And so that what it would take to become one who truly knows God is to become one who truly loves God. And to, we can, in fact, the scary thing about that prayer, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Sisters and brothers, the scariest thing is that we can have all kinds of knowledge about God and yet be entirely restless in our hearts because we haven't settled into the peace that comes from knowing what it is to be in Christ. We haven't settled our loves and affections on that end. This kind of theme gets unpacked. Sorry, I, mean, I could do Augustine all day, which I don't think is the end of the world. This is, let's think of it this way. The Protestant Reformation was an Augustinian renewal movement. And so what we celebrate on Reformation Day is actually the remembering of, Paul, of Augustine's reading of Paul. And to see the same dynamic, the, the dynamic is this. I love in order to know. In other works, um, most notably in Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, sometimes translated on Christian doctrine, which is really a lame translation. It's more on Christian teaching. It's a manual for preachers. And in that work, Augustine emphasizes, again, the priority of love. Because Augustine says, if I am going to understand a text rightly, if I'm going to understand creation rightly, if I'm going to understand God rightly, it's not just the what that I have to learn, it's the how. And for Augustine, he makes this really interesting distinction between what he calls use and enjoyment. Use and enjoyment. For Augustine, the world, all of creation, all of the, the gifts of the creation are things that are given to us by the creator to use as a means to ultimately love and enjoy God. So rightly ordered love is to learn how to relate to the creation as a conduit and window and invitation to love the creator. Idolatry, as you might now be able to figure out, is when you actually enjoy the creation instead of the creator. So for Augustine, what it means to love rightly is to relate rightly to the source and origin of all that is because only then will you be able to rightly relate to the gifts that the creator has given you. The condition for recognizing how to use the world, how to read a text, how to know what something means for Augustine is what he calls the right order of love. So it's not something that you can solve intellectually. So in De, De Doctrina Christiana, uh, on Christian teaching, he actually lays out this whole theory of signs for being able to interpret text, but then he goes into this, dig well, it's not a digression, he goes into a discussion of the necessary spiritual disciplines that are required for the preacher. Why? Because it's the spiritual disciplines that rehabituate our loves and longings and desires so that we would be in a place to be able to understand the text. I love in order to know. He ends at one point in De Doctrina by saying this, living a just and holy life requires one to be capable of an objective and impartial evaluation of things. To love things, that is to say, in the right order, so that you do not love what is not to be loved or fail to love what is to be loved or have a greater love for what should be loved less. And what's interesting, he says, so you have to know how to evaluate things. But the evaluation itself requires right love. It's an affective evaluation. This is not, when he says that this is an objective evaluation of things, this is not your grandma's objectivity. If, if your grandma was a child of the German Enlightenment, say. Uh, um, it, objectivity here and proper evaluation 
is actually bound up in a relationship. The objectivity it takes to see creation as creation, as a gift from the creator, as a window to the creator, that takes love. That takes a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, what might all of this mean for you here in seminary? Friends, I say this somewhat confessionally. Knowledge is easy. Love is hard. Knowledge is easy. Love is hard. The pursuit of ideas and doctrines and facts and intellectual data, I get it. It's energizing, it's thrilling, it's fulfilling. But in an odd sort of way, the sort of intellectual accumulation, that sort of intellectual accumulation is both easier than love and much less without it. All of our doctrinal prowess is but a clanging symbol without love. Indeed, for Paul then, it's not even really knowledge. It's not true wisdom or understanding. If we love in order to understand, if the right order of love is the condition for right understanding, then to pursue theological wisdom is to seek constant healing of our disordered loves. In short, as Augustine suggested, it actually requires immersing ourselves in the spirit-charged practices of gathered Christian worship and the spiritual disciplines, which are the hospital for sick loves. What it means is that to gather as the community of learners, of theological seekers in, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School to do that, this space and these practices are not extracurricular. They are co-curricular. These are part of the program. This is the necessary formation that it takes for us to be in a place to learn, to know. We hate this reality. You won't fix disordered loves with more knowledge. You can't fix disordered loves with more knowledge. The Spirit will heal and restore our loves through the means of grace, the word and the sacraments. It's not magic. <laughs> the gift of God is the practices that the Spirit of God gives us. These disciplines are the kind of supernatural IV drip for those who would know rightly and discern wisely. So, do you desire theological knowledge and doctrinal wisdom? then make Paul's prayer for the Philippians your own prayer. May my love abound more and more. I want to close with a prayer from St. Augustine as my prayer for you and for us together as we seek this end. Let's pray. Now thee only I love, thee only I follow, thee only I seek, thee only am I ready to serve, because thou alone art justly, Lord, I desire to be under thy jurisdiction. Command, I beseech thee, as thou wilt, but heal and open my ears that I may hear thy voice. Heal and open my eyes that I may see thy beckoning. Drive madness from me that I may recognize thee. Tell me whither I must go that I may behold thee, and I hope to do all of that thou dost command. Receive, I pray, thy fugitive, most clement Father and Lord. Amen.